Hie thee to the ocean city, to the Yggdrasil labyrinth, a journey to the blue depths, to conquer the shadows of night. Though you know not what this means, you go towards Armor Road. What awaits is time's end, death's demise, a tempestuous dream, to push away the unfathomable dark and bring light to Armor Road. A stormy adventure begins. Hey there everyone, Zare here, and welcome to Etrian Odyssey 3. Hey Hawk, welcome to the stream. So, what are we in for? So, it is an Atlas game, so that's already going to color your expectations. It's somewhere in the middle as far as popularity goes, as far as I can tell. It's not as big as their main series, SMT or Persona, though it's also not forgotten amongst the general populace. It is a dungeon crawler RPG, very reminiscent of Wizardry, some of the earlier SMT games, uh, SMT Strange Journey. I'm just appreciating how gorgeous this title screen is and the music. Oh, we are in for so much good music. Alright, well, let's get started. The Ocean City Armor Road, far to the south, is said to have a ruin leading below the waves. If it tacitly, as if tacitly admitting it, the Senatus rolling over Armor Road have invited explorers to their city. The invitation drew throngs of eager explorers who gathered to traverse the undersea maze. But none of the throngs who came to the chap none of the throngs who came to challenge the maze were strong enough to master it. The impenetrable ruins came to be known as the Yggdrasil Labyrinth, and its legend spread further. You yourself are an explorer who has heard its legend and now sail to Armor Road to investigate. Your only objective to challenge the labyrinth and win fame and fortune. Your hour is at hand. Wait, right. options limited, so let's check out the Explorers Guild. Hello, newcomers! You're standing in the one and only Explorers Guild in the ocean city of Armor Road. I'm here to supervise all the explorers who find themselves in our Fairburg. Here's a little something I give every new guild for signing up. Now, let's get to it. First, write your guild name on the space provided on the certificate. Think hard, because that name may be known across... The Seven Seas someday. It all depends on you. So, there is no set characters in this game. You are going to be creating your own, and you will be following their adventures. As a consequence, this does mean that the storytelling aspects of the game are a bit more centered around the environment and the secondary characters than your main crew. Armonia, huh? An odd name, but I like it. Well then, step two is registering explorers in your guild. You'll need to hire a few folks, but it's up to you whether or not you want to become a member too. At the Explorers Guild, you can register explorers and organize your party. Choose your favorite classes from the list and form a party of up to five explorers. Alright, so first, we're going to want to check out Register. And here is where the first half part of the game begins. Now, 
There are ten classes available to you. You have the Prince slash Princess, the Gladiator, Hoplites, Buccaneers, Ninjas, Monks, Zodiacs, Wildlings, Arbalists, and Farmers. And we're going to give a general overview of the classes, not too in-depth. It is an unfortunate shortcoming of these games that they are not very forward in presenting the user's useful information. Now the good news is there's lots of supplementary information out there on the internet. But in the game itself, it leaves a bit to be desired. So first of all, how these stars work. I have arranged them such that any class with a 5 star in a stat is the class that gets the highest value in that stat. If they have 1 star, then they have the lowest value. And if they're anywhere in between, then they are ranked proportional to where they are to those extremes. HP, very straightforward if you played any RPG before. These are your health points. Every time you get hurt, you will lose HP proportional to the damage you take. If you run out of HP, your character dies. Don't worry, it's not as permanent as it sounds. Though, if everyone in your party is dead, that's game over. TP, MP, SP, however you call it, this is how you're going to use your skills. Each active skill will take an amount of TP, and if you don't have enough TP in reserve, then you will not be able to use it anymore. Strength is one of the most straightforward stats. It affects how much your strength-based attacks do. This includes your basic attack and most of your skills. Tech is more complicated. So it contributes to how well your party is able to uh, maneuver around enemies, giving you advantageous turns in front and preventing the enemy doing the same to you. Uh, it affects your accuracy. It affects your tech-based damage and your healing. It affects how well you can inflict status ailments, and it affects how much damage you take from enemy tech-based attacks. Going back to simple with VIT, it controls how much damage you take from strength-based attacks. Agility also contributes to the party's ability to uh, have advantages in, count in encounters. It affects your escape chance. It has a large effect on your accuracy. And it also controls how quickly in the battle you move. And finally, luck also influences escape chance. Has a minor impact on accuracy. Has a large effect on how well you can inflict ailments. And has an effect on how well you... Uh, avoid ailments and recover from them. Now this slide is a bit more subjective, but this is going over the different roles that your party can fulfill. These aren't official, these are just my uh, assertion of what goes on in these games. Uh, if you've got zero stars next to them, that means they learn nothing that helps with the roll whatsoever. If they have one star, then they learn something, but it's not anything spectacular, and it doesn't really win them over to the roll on its own. If they have two stars, then they've got something significant there, though it might need a little bit of support to get it up to three stars, where the class is basically built around doing this roll. Starting from the top, damage is how well they can inflict single target damage. This is a very important role. Uh, crowd control is how well they deal with large swaths of enemies. This can either be by attacking multiple enemies with their skills at the same time, or inflicting certain ailments that take them out of the fight momentarily so that you can deal with those that uh, are a little feistier. Uh, disruption Oops. is how well the uh, member can interrupt what your enemies are doing. So giving them different status elements or otherwise screwing up their plans. 
Support is buffing your team, making sure that they do more damage and die less. The tank will control aggro and can also nullify certain attacks if they know when to uh, predict them. Uh, the healer heals. They'll give you HP and they will also uh, restore your status. And exploration is dealing with exploring the labyrinth itself. You'll get field skills or ways to recover TP, which keeps your party going. And finally, a bunch of miscellaneous symbols. The top row are the weapons that each class can equip. The next row are their armors. It should be noted that the gladiators and the wildlings only get access to some shields. Uh, the next two rows, which is always going to be one, are the different damage types that your party can contribute. So, starting with the Prince, we have Fire, Ice, Volt, and Almighty. Almighty being a damage type that is generally never resisted and never uh, weakened. So it will usually do the same amount of damage to all targets, assuming all other factors are equal. There are some enemies that cheat this a little bit, but they are notable exceptions. And then you've got the physical types, where the Gladiator has Slash and Bash, and the Hoplite has Pierce, and then they are spread out throughout. And then the last rows are the status ailments that they have access to. We'll get into those more in depth as we encounter them. Alright, let's get us a party! course, we are going to have to start with the leader, because that is what you do. Now, each class is going to have eight portraits for general ones, uh, one male, or two males and two females, alternating, and then you can also hit the Y button to switch their palettes, giving you a total of eight portraits to choose from. Okay. So next, I think we're going to need our tactician. Regrettably, there are no umlauts. Or any other special characters. Alright, and I think every school group needs their jock. And you can't have an RPG without a healer. And finally, to round things out, I think we need a pair of taglongs. Now, we have 24 slots to fill here. You don't need to fill them all, but there's no penalty in doing so. I'm not going to fill all of them, but there are a couple 
of extras that I want to put on the team. Can't have too many ninjas. And finally, you have 10 classes to choose from. There is one class that I never recommend you getting. Farmers are just not good. They focus on exploration, which has some neat things that you can do with them. But in battle, they are next useless. They have very niche things and very steep penalties for the things they do have. So, let's make five. Alright, so now that we have registered all of our members of our guild, let's organize them a little bit. Uh, actually, this is not what I'm thinking. Uh, something to note, once you choose your name and portrait, it is permanent for that character. You can always make a new character, but as things develop, there's going to be very few things that you can do about that. Uh, we'll go over some of these options later. I will mention rename right now. This does let you rename, but not change the portrait of your characters. It costs money. So, better to think hard about the name and get it right on the first try. Next formation. We have six slots, but we can only bring five members with us. We're going to go back. Actually... Yeah, I think I've got to do this another way. Uh, first, I'm going to pull out the ninjas.
and we slide down to Custom. Skill. In the Custom menu, you can spend skill points to learn new skills. In this game, for each level you gain, you earn only one skill point. Use them wisely, either to strengthen existing skills or to learn new ones. Very important that you come in here before you head into the labyrinth. Otherwise, you're basically sending in a bunch of naked explorers. Now, there are lots of fun, interesting things to do with ninjas, but for now, we don't care. Everyone has access to common skills. For the most part, you don't want to deal with these. HP and TP up, there is an argument for. Putting one point in gives you 10% boost to that stat. Not very useful early on, but later on it will uh, improve. You do get uh, diminishing returns as you invest further into this, but you can still increase these stats. Bandage is only useful right at the beginning of the game, and that's if you have no healers. It's a healing skill that's fairly cheap, but heals pitiful damage and can only be used outside of battle. Chop, mine, and take. I can't recommend using these because we have farmers. Farmers completely negate the need for these skills. But what these would do is uh, there are going to be points in the labyrinth that you can farm resources from. Putting points into these will let you access those resources. And finally, what I am going to be dumping all of my points into, combat study. Each point you put into here gives them 1% of the exper or, yeah, of the experience that your Labyrinth Explorers gain. This does not detract from the party experience, so if you get 100 experience, then they will get 1, and then at max level they will get 10% of that. This is significant because if you get 100 experience and you have a party of 5, each of those party members are only getting 20 because you split it among all surviving members. So that's actually a pretty good return on investment. I said we are not going to be using these characters right out the gate. Having them learn some experience, very handy. And we're going to do the same for this lot. back on the bench for now, let's pull out our main team. And we'll take a look at what they have. So wildlings specialize in summoning allied monsters to help you out. A lot of these will come bearing status ailments, and they are pretty good at inflicting them. we want to do. Ah, yes. So, like I mentioned, there are resources online. These descriptions really don't help explain anything that's going on, so I recommend looking those up if you're playing your own Etrian Odyssey game. Also, worth noting that this, despite appearances, is a skill tree. You can see some of these grayed out ones. To the right, you'll have the prerequisites. Uh, so... I think we'll rush this for you.
Okay, and you... I build up to you. So, uh, oh, yeah, I should probably explain what I'm putting points into. So, mostly I'm putting points into this because it's a prerequisite, but it also does improve the success rate of uh, your beast applying ailments. So, I'm dumping three into there to get access to the beast that I want to start investing in. Here, I'm going to put points into Fist Mastery, also part as a prerequisite for the skill I want, but this will let the monk do more damage when he's unequipped. Alright, uh... For you... I think we'll want to get our healing set going. So healing will do some fairly standard HP healing. Refresh will cure status ailments to one ally. And as we level this up, uh, worth noting, a lot of the times uh, you'll get small incremental benefits until suddenly you'll get large benefits. And attached to those large benefits are going to be spiked TP costs. Refresh is the opposite for now. And that is going to lower the TP cost from, I think it's, uh, it's from 6 to 5. But once we hit a certain threshold, it will start targeting more party members at the expense of more TP. For now, it's mostly going to be prereqs that we can benefit from with ERA. Zodiacs are your standard mages. But you do need to get some upfront investment before you can get their skills. And Arbalists are crossbow users that do big damage. Giant kill is amazing. Because, especially starting out, but even as we move on, you're going to find that all enemies have notably higher HP than you. It is comparing com uh, current HP, so do keep that in mind. But, if you've lowered them far enough that they're no longer that far ahead of your HP, then they're probably on their last legs anyways. All right, looks like you're ready to go. Your next stop should be the senators to introduce yourself. Oh, but before you go, let me explain one more thing. It's about the documents I just gave you along with the guild certificate. Smart explorers actually read them carefully. If you don't feel like it, just throw them away. But if you hope to go all the way in the labyrinth, you'd be well served giving them a look. In this game, powerful abilities called limit skills can be used by up to five party members. Limit skills can be learned by obtaining documents with the skill details written in them. Gather various limit skills and use them well to make your time in the labyrinth easier. And actually, I do want to do one last thing. Because there's one person that we didn't give skills to. With noting, you can have a party with fewer than five members. Generally not recommended, unless you really know what you're doing. Ah, uh, custom. You study. Alright, so, Senator seems like the next stop. You're outsiders, aren't you? Let me guess, you were drawn here by the rumors of the Labyrinth. Then you'd best remember this. You stand in an assembly hall of the Senators, 
Amarod's government. And I am she who wields the Senatus' authority to manage explorers such as yourselves. This is where so-called explorer skills are tested to sort the true warriors from the cowards. If you want to be recognized as true Armor Road Explorers, accept the mission I issue you now. This is where we're going to get the main story missions. Anyone daring to survive as an explorer here in Armor Road must first pass the Senatus' official test. You have been tasked with creating a map of B1F. The long and short of it is that you are to draw your own map of the Labyrinth's first floor. The guard there will have more details for you. Look to him before you proceed. Ah, uh, but you must have parchment first, eh? Here's the blank map given to explorers. Use it well. And here is one of the main features of the Eternian Odyssey series. You get to draw your own map. Your map is your best friend. Get acquainted with your map. Treat your map well. And it will save your ass. There are some other things we can do here, but not particularly interesting at this time, other than perhaps talk. If you're as talented as you'd have me believe, there'll be many more opportunities to come here. Just don't get lost in the assembly hall on your way here. Before we dive into the forest, we should probably touch base with a couple more establishments. First at Napier's Farm. What's this? Unfamiliar faces? Let me guess, new explorers lured by the sweet scent of profit? In that case, welcome to Napier's Firm. We carry all the weapons, armor, and tools you'll require. Here at our firm, the customer's god. We'll spare no expense for those who line our coffers. Though that is conditional on you participating in a transaction. No window shoppers, please. Isn't Eddie charming? Alright, so this calls for another infographic. Because they don't explain this very well. So we have mentioned that agility is... Uh, paramount to your uh, attack speed, but what they never mention anywhere is that your equipment affects it too. These are all significant boosts even though the numbers look low, so it is something to keep in mind. Now you will sometimes have to buy into the slower equipment, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you should be aware of the consequences. So, taking a look at it, you can get a plus four to your action speed if you have boots. And this will fill any of the spare armor slots you can see at the bottom there. You have three armor slots and one weapon slot. Uh, you can equip whatever you want into the armor slots, so long as they are armor, boots, helmets, uh, gauntlets, or accessories. But you can only have one of each type, except accessories, which you can fill up on. So you can have boots, daggers will give you a plus three, rapiers will give you a plus two, as will light clothing. Uh, katanas and gauntlets will give you a plus one speed. Swords, helmets, and accessories don't affect it. Guns, books, and medium armor and shields will slow you down one. Crossbows and heavy armor will slow you down two. Spears will slow you down three, and finally clubs will tank your speed with a minus four. Let's see, first we should take a look at weapons. And down at the bottom, it will tell you what's going on with the weapon and which classes can equip it. Each class has its own unique initial, so you can quickly look at it through that lens. Uh, you are going to want a spear. 
there are certain weapons that are exclusive to farmers. They're generally not great, but it's an exclusive perk. Uh, you, I'm actually going to take the weapon off. You can stay with the dagger for now. Um, wisdom book would be nice because it increases your tech. Uh, you definitely need a crossbow. How's my money doing? There you are. We'll do armor first and then we'll come back for that book. Everyone's stuck with Summer Tweed with their default equipment. So if you remember our speed charts, Straw Hats are defense plus five and no action speed change. Our gloves are defense plus four and plus one action speed. Shiro Sandals, plus two defense, plus one strength, and plus four action speed, which makes them very tempting. I should bring up, though, uh, the attack and defense stats that you can see on the bottom window. They are not actually tied to anything mechanically. They will give you a rough estimate of your power, but... Uh, they're not something you could depend on. Speed on the healer is pretty good. But that much defense at this level can be fairly significant. We don't need the strength. No, I think we need speed. And you're not I'm not as worried about. We have gone over budget if we wanted to get any of the accessories, which would boost our stats a significant amount. But they are not cheap. We can also heal ourselves if we stock up on some potions or medicas. But I think we are looking at that book. here. All right, next very important location. Mon's in. Welcome to Mon's in, boss. Not only can you spend the night here, we have doctors to treat your wounds too. So, is this your first time in Armored? Isn't it awesome? Those clear seas, those blue skies? This is where we will go to heal. The healing, first of all, will let you go to a different time, if you so choose. 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. It will fully recover your HP and TP, but it won't bring you back from the dead. That's what this is for. Uh, it should be... Worth noting that these costs will scale with your party's levels. 
so while it will be relatively cheap now, it will slowly creep up. Though thankfully, not as much as your income will. Uh, we have a storing feature. If you have any items that you don't want to sell, but want to hold on to, but don't want to have cramming up your inventory, you can use this. It does cost money to access it though. So don't go in and out frequently. And most importantly, save. We're gonna be seeing a lot of this. The first save is a bit lengthy. Overall, Etrian Odyssey save times do take a while, but they should be shorter than that moving forward. And we don't need to deal with any of these other locations just yet, so let's poke our heads into the forest. You step into the unyielding forest known as the Yggdrasil Labyrinth. Though many explorers have lost their lives in its halls, it is surprisingly beautiful. The breathtaking flowers here are enough to make you feel as if you are simply out for a nature walk. But you mustn't let your guard slip, even for a moment. Go forth and explore, always remembering that this forest is fundamentally a dangerous place. Alright, we're out of map. In fact, I want to check my options. We should be good on that front. These are all good. No wait, perfect. Normal speed. Auto map on. So auto map will fill in floor tiles onto your map automatically as you step onto them. By no means necessary. Helpful. Also, you'll see save on the menu, access by start. This is a quick save feature if you are in the middle of something and you need to drop it down for a moment, you use this, it will exit you out of the game, and the next time you load your quick save, it will delete that quick save, so be careful with that. Also, we have forward, backwards, turns, and strafing with the LNR buttons. There's one thing you must be aware of before you begin your adventures in the labyrinth. As you have some skill at adventuring, some three skill points should be available to you. To spend them on skills useful in the labyrinth, open the main menu with the Y button. Select custom to uh, allocate these skill points. Combat, healing, and protective skills will all be essential to survival during your journeys. You may already be aware of this, in which case this advice is happily unnecessary. If so, then hesitate no longer to begin your adventure in this lush green forest. Alright, so on the top screen, in the bottom right corner, you'll notice that there is a pulsing light that has been changing colors as we make steps. This is your enemy encounter indicator. And I'll get into it after this guy. While appreciating the roar of the nearby cataract, you find a guard alone at a crossroad. I heard there'd be newcomers in the guild coming. Welcome to the Yggdrasil Labyrinth, dude. The guard, <laughs> the guard greets you cheerfully, and then motions toward the unmasked map you hold. The unmarked map you hold. I'm sure they told you at the Senators, but your first task is to map this floor. Mine, meanwhile, is to instruct beginners such as yourselves in the cartographic arts. Upon saying this, the guard explains slowly and plainly to you how to draw a map. In this game, you'll draw your own map on the bottom screen with the stylus. Keep careful and accurate notes on the dungeon's layout as you explore it. So we can use the X button to change the zoom. Though we can only draw on it if we're at the maximum zoom. 
And if we touch the map, it will zoom into that location. You draw walls, erase, paint, erase. And we've got some useful icons. Uh, so all of these icons are drag and drop. And what you see is what you get for most of them. The one exception is this red triangle. If you put that down, you get to put your own notes down. And you can drag to the trash can to remove them. Auto movement. You can use these to indicate some things if you want, but the main draw to them is if you have them and you press the play button, they become active. And when you step on them while they're active, they will make you automatically move in that direction. This is useful if you're going to a floor that you've already been to, and so it lets you quickly traverse it without too much thought or effort. That concludes your cartography lesson. Draw your map thus, then show me your finished work. The guard then steps back, as if to indicate that his duty has been discharged. You may do as the guard says and venture forth to complete your map, or stay and question him. As you walk through the labyrinth, you encounter the guard at his post in the crossroads. Some questions come to mind, and you hesitate whether to ask them or leave them be. We did it! You present the parchment with your map on it and inform the guard your task is complete. The guard pours over your map with a critical eye and responds in a stern voice. No, no! This won't do either. Try harder before you come to me again. It seems your map is not yet complete. You must continue to search through the labyrinth before your mission is finished. The guard turns his head this way and... Th this way and that before answering your question. It's said that the labyrinth was created following the calamity over a hundred years ago. Many were wounded, and the old city was destroyed. Everything suffered that day. Ironic, no, that we used the labyrinth formed by the calamity to restore the ocean city? After speaking his piece, the guard sighs and continues. Uh, and that is the th sum of our knowledge. We still have no inkling of what lies deeper. I hope that explorers like yourselves will one day master that mystery. The guard then falls silent, as a man who has said all there is to say. You may continue to engage the guard in conversation or leave the spot. Alright, so, world is our oyster. Let's start going south. Our first campaign begins. Oh no, that's not good. All right, so your commands are front loaded. Everyone gets to input their commands before they're acted out. And they're acted out in order of their action speed. there. Oh, no, that's right. While exploring, you come across a large box. Would you like to open it? Always do. Right, nectar, very useful. This will revive a dead ally. And, as is intuitive, the traditional marker for a treasure chest is the clover. A small crevice is visible in the wall before you. Perhaps a person may fit through. So we have just activated a shortcut. 
And we've also got an important hint. So you can see that this wall has a certain look to it, whereas this wall has blue flowers. This is our hint that on this strata, any wall with blue flowers probably leads to a shortcut. However, small crevice is visible in the wall before you. Perhaps the person may fit through. However, it appears to be impassable from this side. Passwords need, or passwords, uh, shortcuts need to be open from one direction before they're accessible both ways. Most of the time. There are some exceptions, but they are the exceptions. You're not closed off. I'm a terrible cartographer. You make an attempt to ignore the guard and press past him, but he stops you sharply. You return and the guard's stern voice hails you once again. Is your map complete? Show me that I might examine it. So we gotta go up. I'm gonna hang it around here though. Let's get an easy encounter to start things off. That's a bit better. So I am identifying the frog as a much bigger threat. Polish that off. Try again, Surin. If you targeted an enemy and it dies before your turn comes up, you will target a random enemy from the remaining pool. Hey, that was a good first visit. I'm not going to spend the money to heal, but I am going to save. We well, got some spoils from that fight? No, we didn't. Absolutely nothing. Normally, you'll get monster parts whenever you beat an enemy, and you come back here and sell them to Eddie, and this will get you money. It will also get you new equipment. here and talk about discoveries, though. This will be our bestiary, and we'll have a lot of information, and by a lot I mean not nearly as much as I want. We know virtually nothing about these. Uh, future titles give you a lot more information, thankfully, but no such luck here. We will fill in those question mark items as we pick up their drops. But somehow we got nothing. things happen. There's a nice starter encounter.
always useful to poke your head in at the dead ends, because usually there are events. As you venture through the tree-choked area, you notice that you have come to a dead end. You find an old sign in front of the wall of trees, written in large print. Caution! Not all roads in the labyrinth lead ahead. Only explorers who are careful to examine their full surroundings will be able to continue forth. You surmise that the sign, which contains elementary advice, was written for novice explorers. You tip your cap to its wisdom before returning to your investigation. Remembered that I have routinely ignored the guild members' advice. So limit skills. As you fight, you will build up a limit bar. And once it reaches full, then a member who has it can use their limit skills, which are generally more powerful than what you have commonly available to you. So we've got Cross Slash, which is a physical attack. Indomitable, which makes someone injure. And charge a tactic, which will raise allies attack. So I think what we want to do here... So we'll give cross slash to our two offensive units. Sven will eventually be that. He's just not quite there yet. A small crevice is visible in the wall before you. Perhaps a person may fit through. However, it appears to be impassable from the side. Hmm. That's not a two-way shortcut. Ah, excellent. Preemptive attack. We get a full round where the enemy doesn't do anything. Skills is not an amazingly useful menu, as you can only use healing skills and exploration skills, which you don't see that many of. But still, if you have a healer, you're going to drop in there every so often. Uh, so we're out of TP on the healer. I want to be careful about going too far. Because we're probably going to want to double back and save and heal before we reach that shortcut down there.
Uh, moments like this. The L button triggers auto attack. Everyone will use a basic attack. This will continue on until you press L again, at which point the current round will end. Well, you'll go through the animations until the round ends, and then you'll get control back. If you don't hit that by the time it turns back to the round start, then you'll automatically do the next round. Alright, we have got a door. This is one of those harvesting spots I mentioned. Unfortunately, we don't know how to cut plants. We'll put a mark for this later. The scissors are your standard chop marks. Oh, Sven, when did you get so low? Everybody levels. But when we level up, we get a skill point, which means we drop by the custom menu. Now we're going to give Zephyra call insect. This will summon a poison butterfly into the empty spot in our team. So we have three members up front and two members behind, meaning the insect will go behind. When it comes out, it will do an attack that tries to poison the enemy, and every turn after that, it will randomly do the attack again. Uh, you... I'm gonna get this one. Not generally a good skill, it increases the rate at which you recover ailments, but it's much better to just use an item or skill to recover than to wait it out. But it's a prerequisite for something I want to get. Let me refresh a little cheaper. Place attack. More dead giants. Yeah, that seems like a good point to start heading back. Oh, that's everyone's HP. Limits do not take up your turn, and they generally have a high priority, so when you're ready to use one, be prepared for that to go first. Uh, 
And we didn't even summon the butterfly. And we got a slimy leg! It's every adventurer's dream. That's a good stretch of map. And now that we've sold those off, we got new equipment that we can buy. So if we compare that to someone else who has a dagger, Oh, yeah, okay. Get a get a party there. But no one's going to be using daggers in the long run. Please increase vitality instead of strength and give you plus two defense over the Shuro sandals. Skill jerkins are plus two defense. Keep those in mind if we start really hurting. But generally, you don't want to be making small increments in armor. You do want to be regularly updating your armor, but you don't need to grab every slight advantage you get as uh, the defense provided by armor is less than that provided by vitality. All right, back we go. Oh, joy. Alright, so right now, Era and Jin are blinded. This means that their accuracy drops by 66%, and they can no longer dodge attacks. Good news is, most status ailments will recover once a battle is won. 
Or you run away. You don't have to win. You just have to survive. This sounds like a great time to beat feet. Because that! The Lynx is the novice killer. You know, just in case you thought you had a handle on this. my goal. So now we have opened up that shortcut. Whoops. Which means we can come back there quickly and easily. Let's go wake Sven up. So how encounters work is they're generally keyed to different areas of a floor. So we do not encounter any lynxes in the first part of the labyrinth, but once we cross a certain threshold, they enter the rotation. We have to keep that in mind as we're exploring these later portions. We are capable of killing a lynx, but we really want to have every advantage we can when it comes to that. Because it's just going to one-shot someone in the front row. With its basic attack. Made a good chew. It may surprise you to learn that it's a better Medica and one hundred N, not bad. maps in Etrian games. Looks like it's going to be difficult to get to that shortcut, so it might not be required for the mission. Three fish!
Okay, we can press on a little further. Oh! Oh, she's just hung on. Um, run? Running sounds good. Running sounds good. Right, so like I was saying, it's about time we head back to town. on the healer. Okay, yeah. Time to take a nap. Oh, we gotta be careful. We're not making profit on these runs. amount of experience off the next level, so I'm not going to grind the easy stuff unless it really comes down to it. We might be able to handle a length if it doesn't uh, blindside us. Yeah. That didn't pan out. Uh, okay, someone is going to die, but I think we'll win. This is definitely the kind of game where you don't get attached to player symmetry. If you are, you're going to have a very miserable time trying to keep everyone alive and getting the same amount of experience. It's just not worth it. That said, I don't want to spend a nectar here. I'll be valuable. more valuable than 10 nen. At this rate, everyone except for Sven is going to get a level up soon.
All right, so we know that the forest frogs have some offense, and the durians are mostly defensive. So let's focus down the frog. As you continue through the forest, you reach a hall where colorful blossoms emit a sweet scent. The peculiar flowers sway in the wind. Their sweet fragrance grows more alluring. You consider resting here to more fully enjoy the flower scent. Let's try this. See how Paul goes. Ah, it doesn't. Oh well. You rest your weary muscles, the beautiful flowers and their sweet aroma all around you. Now fully rested, you resume your exploration of the labyrinth. That was nice. And it benefited everyone who has TP. Oh, please. Nothing bad ever happens in the labyrinth. As I say that. Levels! You don't get any. Uh... We'll learn more about binds later. 
but they're similar to ailments. Just with their own set of properties. Mostly, I'm grabbing this as a prerequisite for another skill. But it will be handy once it becomes relevant. As you slowly grow accustomed to navigating the forest, you find small footprints at a dead end. The footprints lead east, where you can hear something like an animal's cry beyond the bushes. Should we investigate? Always investigate, alright. As you carefully peer into the bushes, you find an animal caught in a hanging snare. You hear the cries of its brethren all around, as if in response to its piteous wailing. Should we do it good? After you cut the rope with a knife and remove the trap, the animal nimbly jumps down. The animal is still young. Once it is freed, two of its kind that seem to be its parents emerge. You freeze. You can see that your luck is about to be put to the test. If your luck fails, the beast will misinterpret your kindness and attack. So it's going to do a secret skill check. Hopefully we're lucky. We were not lucky. The beast glare at you and begin to growl. It seems they've perceived you as a threat. Your goodwill was misunderstood, and now you must fight the beasts who stand ready to pounce. So, wonderful news! We're not supposed to encounter these creatures until the next floor. And as you may have guessed, they're poisonous. Uh, it's not going to do much poison damage, but I think we need a sixth person here. Okay, poison. This is gonna be fun. So you're probably familiar with poison from other games. This is not other games. The amount of damage that poison done is keyed to whatever skill activated it. The enemies use this to great effect by having very high values on their skills. And then when it's afflicted onto your characters, you take tons of damage. The good news is, you can exploit this somewhat. By rushing poison yourself, you'll outpace the damage for the early game and have a very potent source of damage. It does, unfortunately, start to fall behind towards the mid-game, so it's not reliable beyond there. Uh... Yeah, we gotta get that poison off of you. Because I don't think Indomitable is going to protect you from that. Hey! 
That wasn't so bad. Our luck. No, I think we're gonna need at least one more trip anyways. So, try to make our way back to safety, which is going to be quicker. I think the long way is probably gonna be better, because it'll get us to easier enemies. Hey, there's our Envy. Now to blow it. Oh, that looks like it's very good. That's a huge improvement. I should get that for Sephira. Poor again. So it goes. Suspicious empty space on that map. So let's take a look at this wall. That looks promising. I'm just going to pop back here for a sec and clear out this area so I don't have to come back again. Oh, just a normal Medica. I'm better than having to buy one. Okay, two-way.
Ooh, Amrita's. Very useful. Please will heal the TP. Feel kitty. It's locked. Put a treasure chest down, but we'll make a note to ourselves. How's everyone doing? Oh, we're doing amazing. Let's clear up that top area. Walking the path, lush greenery and vibrant flowers surrounding you, you reach a dead end. Gentle sunlight shines through the leaves and you hear the chirping of birds. It's so peaceful here. You don't sense any monsters around. This spot seems ideal to take a rest. But continuing your exploration seems more important than resting here, so you take your leave. That's curious. Always good to leave yourself a note if something peculiar happens in the labyrinth. Is your map complete? Show me that I might examine it. Hmm. 
The guard's previously stern countenance lightened up upon, upon examining your work. Oh, you've done a simply wonderful job here! His expression utterly transformed, the guard showers you with effusive praise. Go now hence to the senators, and report to them your success to claim your reward. That's a mighty fine map, if I do say so myself. Alright, so... When it comes to missions, actually, good habit to develop is save first. First, we'll report our discoveries. These are all the items that we've picked up. We'll give you some hint of where you can find them from and their value, as well as some interesting details about it. Report results. Now before you go do this, you want to check your party. Make sure everyone's conscious and that you're not using anyone not in your main team. Word has reached me of your success in completing the map. You've proven your mettle as explorers strong enough to challenge the labyrinth. I'll authorize the sale of items at Napier's firm, which you may find necessary in your travels. I'll also send word to the pier that God Ammonia requires a seaworthy vessel. That should allow you to set out on voyages whenever the seafaring urge may strike. Train yourself in battle on the open seas and gain power enough to someday grant my wish. Whenever you complete a mission, you get a boatload of experience. This only goes to your main party, however. So don't miss out by having someone unconscious. You can also use this to your advantage if you've got some particularly weak party members. You can just slot them in and they get the experience without having to exude any effort. Uh, so... Save from that. And then let's, yeah, check out the board. Members of Armonia, this is Inver, Armoro's largest trade port, or what's left of it. When the calamity struck a century ago, the topography changed and commerce ended. Since then, many have worked to reopen trade routes, but nobody can get ships out past these currents. That's why the Senatus and I are asking explorers to set sail and create new sea charts. The rewards are handsome indeed. If you can chart a course from here to the north, it'll be worth it. I've even gotten them to lend you a ship, exclusively for Harmonia's use. Got a name in mind? I think we should just name it after the team. Hello, Fida. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> Harmonia.
The Electro Swing is operational. You're not the first guild we've given a ship to, but most seem to care about the fishing money. You're different, though. They'll be counting on you to restore Armorode's name as the Ocean City. All right, so this takes your Labyrinth's exploration and turns it into a puzzle. Ah, yes. You also need to load food on your ship. Your provisions determine how far you can range. This isn't very tasty, but it'll keep you going. Use it to learn the ropes of charting the sea. Biscuits. Also, it's a little threadbare, but you should take this flag as well. It's a good luck token, commonly oysted by fishermen praying for a big catch. Your objective is to fill in the sea map, but voyages get pretty costly, so I propose a deal. When you notice fish during your voyage, catch and bring them back. They'll bring in a bit of income. Just make sure you keep your eyes on the real prize. So we get to choose how to outfit our ship. And then we head out. Now, food determines how many moves you get on the map. Once you've run out of moves, you have to go back. Also, depending on what you've equipped, your voyage will cost some N. Right now, pretty cheap, 10 N. But as we get better and better ships, it's going to cost more and more. You set out onto the vast ocean on the small ship you received. Your duty? To chart the boundless ocean, recording its shores and shoals on your map. You decide to start with the area around Armor Road to get used to navigating the seas. Your objective at sea is to explore the seas, filling the map on the bottom screen. You've got a whole whack of new items, or new icons, but it's largely what you remember it being. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, and in order to keep forward momentum going, I do have a map in front of me dealing with the sea chart. It's got the locations of points of interest marked down. However, it does not have directions to those. And as I mentioned, this is a puzzle map. I think this is a fair enough compromise so that I'm not just aimlessly wandering out to sea, or worse, doing this all off screen. But it's still going to involve me puzzling things out. And also, it doesn't tell me the order in which you can acquire these things, so I might be chasing after something that's just out of reach. I should be able to figure that out quickly enough. So we've only got six movement. Let's also not forget to fill in our map. It can be tricky to manage depth perception. We'll do what we can. After boarding your ship and setting sail from Armor Road, you come across a small island. Through your spyglass, you can see marines from Armor Road gathered around, seemingly hard at work. You can disembark here and talk to them, or continue on your way. You disembark, but the marines are too busy with their own tasks to notice you. You decide against pestering them and return to your ship. Alright, well, we'll make sure to put a little reminder here. Do it again. You discover a small, deserted island just ahead of your position, north of Armor Road. You mark the island on your map and attempt to set sail when the trees suddenly sway. 
Something may be nearby. You wonder if you should, should stop to investigate or continue sailing. You disembark and come across a flock of armor-owed sheep with brown wool and spiral horns. From the rear of the flock, you hear the unexpected voice of a man. This here's an island of wild armor-owed sheep. You came by boat, didn't you? The old man emerges from behind the flock. It seems he lives on this island as a shepherd. He explains that the sheep's pen has deteriorated, and he needs good cedar wood to fix it. The old man asks if you can bring back some armor road cedar, found west of the Ocean City. Make a note of his request in your logbook, but you can't be sure when you'll get to it. for this journey. Okay, well, we know some carpenters. Oh, okay. Looking for Armor Road Cedar. Why don't we check Armor Road? Very curious. I'm trying to piece together because from my memory, we should be able to make forward progress here right now. But looking at the map, I've visited everywhere I can with what I have. It's just out of reach. Oh! I think I know what I need to do. On the high seas, as always, you come across an unusual landmark while bearing west. The giant lighthouse to the west of Armor Road towers over the surrounding seas. The lighthouse has stood there for ages, its majestic bearing always visible. You may visit the lighthouse or simply go on your way. Well, we have a destination. 
shadow jumps from the top of the lighthouse up ahead. Its identity turns out to be a monstrous bird that has claimed this territory as its own. The monstrous bird flies past you, causing a strong gale before turning its talons on you. Monstrous bird has destroyed your ship! So, your ship was attacked by the monstrous bird of the lighthouse. Have you heard of the Scandalia Lighthouse? Before the Calamity is a beacon of commerce. But ever since, its light has been extinguished by a bird monster nesting there that attacks ships. So not only are sailors forced to go without its light, we can't even get close enough to repair it. But maybe it has a blind spot, so to speak. Would you guys be capable of finding a safe route there? The Marines on a small island to the north have a stock of dried peas they could share with you. With those, you could sail further. If you get to the beacon, we can dispatch combat engineers. This is a crucial part of restoring Armor Road. I wish you the greatest success. So now the Marines will care about us. A seaman who has watched you disembark addresses you. Oi! What brings you to this tiny island? I make dried peas here as chow for the marines. You explain that you need dried peas to reach the lighthouse. Really now? Well, if that's the case, I'm more than willing to share some with you. They're long-lasting in the hold and the stomach. Marines and labyrinth guards both love them. They ought to come in handy if you're out to explore the sea lanes. You thank the seaman for his dried peas and return to your ship. Now we can change these out for peas. It's more expensive to do so, but we get two more moves. And I am suitably distracted. Fish. I think you start up there. You see a small group on an island near Armroad fishing with a net. They claim to live on this island and fish wherever they feel a craving for seafood. The islanders offer to let you try using a casting net, since the sea nearby is thriving with fish. Your first duty is to draw your sea chart, but the net fishing does seem enjoyable. You decide to learn how to fish with the net. It isn't long before the islanders are bowled over by your quick grasp of the technique. The islanders praise your skill and give you a casting net to commemorate your meeting. Should you ever have a chance to fish in the future, the net will surely allow for a larger haul. You thank the islanders and board your ship again. Hey, we turned a profit on the fish. Ah, oh, it moved. 
Oh well. With the ocean wind in your sails, you discover a coniferous tree growing along the southern coast. Looking closely, you see they are armor road cedars, well known to yield good quality lumber. If you like, you may cut one down. Each of you takes a saw in your hands and sets to work felling a tree. After it comes down with a crash, you load it onto your ship and return to your voyage. Hey, more profit. to visit the sheep so we don't need to haul out the peas. With the armor-road cedar loaded on your, to your ship, you return to the small island inhabited by sheep. On delivering the wood to the old shepherd, he thanks you and gives you a small bag as a reward. Inside is a hunk of sheep cheese, a delicacy beloved of sailors on long voyages. You thank the old man and leave the island in search of more unmapped regions to explore. We broke even. Let's go drop a save. gives us a whopping 16 turns. But they cost a lot. I'm taking a look at the route I want to take next. Sadly, you cannot strafe with boat. Sailing with the southern winds at your back, you reach a small island. The island is small enough for a child to walk across in a day and would be easy to investigate. If you like, you may land here and explore. As you disembark, the vivid tropical flowers put you in mind of some island paradise. You can investigate the area near the flowers or go further into the island.
Having decided to investigate the area, you start strolling about. As you enjoy the sweet smell of the flowers, you feel an itchy sensation at your feet. The itch soon turns into an unbearable stinging pain. You hastily remove your boots. Poisonous ants known as bull ants are swarming all over your feet. The intense pain causes you to flee, but not before gathering some bull ants to take back. Because, you know, that sounds smart. Let's just put a bunch of poison ants on a boat. With your sails billowing in the wind, your ship arrives on a small island. A middle-aged woman spots your ship and flags you down. The lady, who comes from Armor Road, asks you to try her new batch of raisins, which are freshly dried. You pop one in your mouth, and are met with a sublime mix of sweetness and tanginess. You tell her that the raisins are delicious. She seems pleased, and gives you a large bag of them. The raisins would be perfect for maintaining your sugar intake on long voyages. You thank the woman profusely, and take the reasons back to the ship. Of the map, we're at the edge of the map. Now that we have reasons, also sixteen turns, but cheaper. bit out of the way, but I do want to get this. Oh no, uh, I think I've got to wait anyways. Alright, let's see what we can do about that bird. Do I have enough movement for it? I probably should have checked that before going out to sea, but here we are. Oh yeah, easy. Your ship nears one of the many islands that surround Armor Road. It's a featureless island, but on close inspection you see that something has washed ashore. It looks like one of the dolphin statues that were attached to fishing vessels for luck. Thinking that it may prove useful, you decide to salvage it and return to Armor Road.
So as you can probably imagine, that's a whirlpool over there. We do not want to go there. ways will take you whether you want to or not. Yeah, you'll follow them until they terminate. The good news is, it doesn't take up movement, other than the one to enter. Your ship finally reaches the lighthouse feared by many to be a nest of monsters. After noting its location, which none have dared near for over a hundred years, you return to Armor Road. The day of Armor Road's return to glory is now one step closer. I heard from the sailors on guard! You've done a great thing here, members of Armonia. Paving the way to Lighthouse is the first step restoring our city. And we have you to thank. Keep at it, and we'll see Armor Road restored to its former glory. Or better, even! Here's your reward. It's a foremast. Great for catching the wind. Try it out on your ship! By equipping a foremast, the ship's moving distance will always be plus one space. This means every time we hit forward, we'll move forward two spaces, unless we would be prevented from doing so. So if we run into a landmass, that will cut our movement short. If we run into rapids or uh, anything nasty, that will cut us short. Also, now that you've secured a route to the lighthouse, we can take out that monster bird there! We've already had quite a few hot-blooded adventurers try gathering at the port to try their luck. If you're ready, to try lending them a hand. Uh, so I'm gonna go save after all that hard work. Alright, so, sea quests. You have two options here. If you have friends that also have the game, you can connect up to play co-op, where all of, up to four different players will submit members of their guild to form a party. And then you go and fight a boss. If you don't have any friends, you have solo. Skandalia Lighthouse stands close to Armor Road. For years it had dutifully sent its light out to sea, but now it's only a nest of monstrous birds. The way this works is there are three sets of NPC parties for each sea quest, and they each have a different number of party members. You will f supply members to round out the ranks. By the orders of my master, I have come to Armor Road in search of an item called the Swallow's Cowry. Legend tells of a rare bird that births it once in a hundred years. But Princess Kaguya will only marry my master if it is found, and I mean to do so. I'll look to the stars and marvel at their power, but we Zodiacs have learned to harness it. The choice of star is key, as I'd like to view them from the top of a lighthouse to refine my skills. My hometown is a kingdom far to the north. Our king is grand, our generals bright, our citizens noble. Over, by royal tradition, I must hunt a fierce monster to display my strength. Will you help me? So, it sounds like one ninja, two zodiacs. A very deep voiced princess. And a hoplite. Those are these only two? I thought you're supposed to have a different amount.
This is a terrible idea, but let's do it anyways. Unfortunately, we don't get too many details other than a blurb here. And they're all going to take the front row. So, we've got offense. We've got defense. We've got support. I think we'll probably want you... Let's sail towards the end of Raging Waves. With the princess and her vassals in tow, your ship finally reaches the lighthouse of the bird monster. Atop the lighthouse, the bird monster spreads its wings and adopts a menacing stance. The client's vassals quickly step before the princess, forming a defensive phalanx before her. In response, you draw your weapons as well. The princess's valiant command echoes over the commotion, and the battle ensues! Good to know that NPCs will generally make smart plays. They may not have the best builds, but they'll work well with what they have. You'll notice that Benjamin is protecting the princess every time she gets targeted, but never when she's not. likely to be attacked. Oh, and that's not good. So, confusion, you completely lose control of the unit, and they will attack targets randomly, be they friend or foe. It is a very potent ailment, and good news, you get to use it, too.
Well, we got really close, and we might still pull it out. But whenever the front line goes down, your back line takes up the slack. And unfortunately, we can switch, but it will take up our entire turn to do so. And in addition, well, they're all dead, so the best I could do is put one behind the other. And then they'll take attacks, I guess? Since the front line is more likely to be targeted. Oh, we did better than I expected. Well, there is some mercy. You get to save any changes you've made to your maps. Though you will have to keep in mind that any shortcuts that you've taken or chests you've opened will be reset. That you haven't saved, of course. Well, we'll keep that place in mind, but I think we've put off the forest long enough. Oh, but before that, we haven't been to the Butterfly Bistro. Ah, hellos to you! You're the Armonia Guild, yes? I've heard from the Senatus. Here at the Butterfly Bistro, you can talk to people and take on side jobs called requests. There are all kinds of different jobs from monster hunts to item collecting. If you accept a request and complete the mission, report back to me! When you do, I will then give you the reward that the client gives me when they put it up. Doing these requests might make you some easy cash. I'll keep getting more and more requests as time goes on. So come back here lots, okay? That's pretty much it. Do you wanna... Do you want to be taking one of the requests right away? The Bistro is a place that you are going to frequent a lot. So first of all, you're going to get side quests. And like missions, these are worth a lot of experience and monetary and item rewards. That request, eh? Oh yes, do try that one. It is most decidedly easy. I am wanting to make a new menu item here at my bar, and I am needing ingredients. What is required is one frog cheek and three slimy legs. I am most sure you can gather them by killing forest frogs on B1F. You can be- I can be counting upon you, yes? Good, good! Now, hop to it! <laughs> oh ho! You're accepting this request, yes? It is easy, so it's perfect for you. The client is Bill, an apprentice fisherman who is known for being a lazy oaf. He says he is wanting a safe place to sunbathe. I bet he is looking for a nap spot. You may be finding such a perfect spot somewhere on B1F, yes? You find a good place for him and let me know. Yes? That will be the end of this. You be running along now, adventurers. I can be counting on you. You're going to accept this request? It was put up there by the fishing by the city's fishing committee. It is sounding straightforward. Go out on a voyage and catch a tanyin. Simple, yes? The committee wants the tanyin to be from local waters, so catch one near Armor Road. That is all you are having to do. The deep blue sea calls you. Do not keep her waiting. Oh, I am being all excitable about this. Go out of here so I can calm down. We've got a bevy of requests coming. We can also gather information. This refreshes every time you advance floors, so it's a very good idea to come and see what everyone has to say before you do so. They will give you a lot of useful advice, exploration tips, and some other things. Though I don't think we're queued up for any of what I'm thinking just yet. Have you folks been out to sea yet? If you're ever out on the water, try catching some fish. There's all kinds of fish around Armor Road. If you catch any, folks at the port will pay handsomely. The rarer you catch, the more you'll rake in. Give it a try. Mm -mm. Ain't seen ya before. Ain't seen ya before. New explorers, I take it. Alright, here's some advice. Did you know if you beat monsters a certain way, they'll drop different stuff than usual? Some you gotta kill with fire. 
Or maybe to feed them while their arms are bound. That kind of thing. I know all sorts of secret tricks like that to get good treasure. If you want to know them, just ask. I'll give them away for free, but you buy me a drink or something and I'll gladly spill for you. Yo! Haven't seen you a lot around here. Are you new around here? Great. Come on, sit here next to me. I used to challenge the Labyrinth when I was your age, too. You gotta start from B1F. No shortcuts. Speaking of which, have you seen any great lynxes? Shark claws can rip rookies in half. They're weak against fire, but that doesn't make them any easier. It's good practice for beginners. It's a famous phrase around these parts. Great lynxes are where rookies become explorers. All right, you got me. I just came up with that a second ago. <laughs> Travelers new to Amarod, are you? Many such as you have been asking after the labyrinth lately. So much so that I've skipped my text. I'm Wolfram, a troubadour. I've wended my way from the far north all the way to this ocean city. I've been here a long time. I may have a few words of advice about challenging that place. This city where you stand is the world-famous ocean city of Armorode. A free city of clear skies and white clouds, an endless sea, and a vibrant, eclectic culture. Uh, but freedom can't exist without order. This country does have a royal family. Sadly, the modern royal family has been reduced to mere figureheads. But who then governs Armorode? The aristocrats of the Senatus, led by a fearsome old crone. Consider her to be the true power behind Amarod. You'll most certainly meet her yourselves. There's more to Amarod's royal family than that, but let's leave that for another time. Hmm? This ocean city of Amarod was once a great capital where science and technology flourished. But around a hundred years ago, the center of Amarod was suddenly swallowed by the ocean. Afterwards, the rippling waters became tidal waves. The gentle breeze gave way to earthquakes. Armorode's advanced technology was sunk, which ended diplomatic relations with nearby countries. It's been a long road to recovery for Armorode, but even today, it's nowhere near what it once was. Not since the Calamity. If you ask anyone here, you'll get nothing but a stony silence. And again, that's just because no one knows exactly what went on a hundred years ago. It wasn't all bad, mind you. After the Calamity, a labyrinth was revealed, drawing explorers here. Though the Senators had other reasons for gathering explorers, but... That tale can wait for now. Glad you asked! That's the most popular story of the day! I'd appreciate a tip for the telling. Her sobriquet of the porcelain... Her sobriquet of the porcelain princess comes from her pure, white, shining skin. Her voice is like music from the harps of the goddesses, radiant enough to tame monsters. But even the goddesses would linger in her presence for having to compete with her face. She is Princess Gutrun, a lovely goddess of Amarod in her own right. Her visage is the stuff dreams are made of, though, mind you, I've never seen her in person. Each successive princess in Amarod is named Gutrun. I'll tell you the reason later. Did I speak out of turn? I must protest, my profession requires me to sing loud and long. Ah, but I jest, I jest. Come again, explorers, if you wish to hear my stories. As before, you find a guard below some trees off to one side of the path. When he notices your approach, he heals you with a cheerful expression. Made your report to the Senators, have you? That means you've the right to go on ahead from here. In honor of your accomplishment, I'd like you to have this. 
The guard pulls a small metallic hammer from a bag hanging from his waist and offers it to you. It's a forging hammer! Enchanting or enhancing one's weapon is common practice for explorers in Armor Road. If you seriously intend to explore the labyrinth, you should consider doing the same. The guard finishes by giving you not one, but three heavy hammers, which you gladly accept. You may forge at Napier's firm if you possess hammers. You may forge to confer the innate effects of a hammer onto a weapon to strengthen it. When you get a chance, bring your hammers to Napier's firm to try the process out. After the guard has given his gift, he calmly points out the path and moves out of the way. You may proceed apace, or return to town and experiment with your new hammers at the firm. I think we explore. It's you. Don't have fire. The door before you with a moon-shaped insignia has no handle and does not budge when you push it. You seem to have no way to open this door at the moment. You leave it to you leave it be for the moment to explore elsewhere. So mysterious. Hello again. stairs. Worth noting, changing floors will reset the encounter meter. So if you don't want to make an encounter, use these to get some breathing room. And if you do, don't.
I might be fighting my for my life, but it doesn't mean I can't simultaneously draw on a map. As you walk through the forest, you see small yellowish sprouts at the roots of luxuriant trees. The sprouts look as if they might be edible. Will you muster the courage to pluck one and eat it? What do you think? Should we eat one? Surin, entranced by its fresh scent, takes a bite of the sprout and swallows, which is funny because his player is the first person to say yes. <laughs> Suddenly, Surin begins to complain of severe stomach pains. It seems that the sprout, far from being edible, was a species of poisonous plant. Regretting your carelessness, you return to your explorations. So I don't know which of these... Uh, follow the pattern from here on out, but I do know something special about this event, and that's that it will look in your party for certain classes. If you have a farmer in your party, which I don't know why you would, but it is an option before you, they will stop you if you try to eat the plants. They'll identify them as poisonous and you'll move on. If you don't have a farmer, but a gladiator is chosen to eat it, they will instead gain 10 HP by just toughing out the poison, and then feeling awesome for doing so. So depending on your party composition, these events may play out very differently between playthroughs. Also, how are you doing? Yeah, you could use a top-up. There's cats everywhere. Treasure! Weaklings! Feather armor. Very nice cash. So the Bravant is an item. And use it to raise an ally's attack. It's a fairly significant buff. So it's a very popular item. Uh, meanwhile... Uh, you can't wear it. So Prince Gladiator, Hoplite, Buccaneer, Monk, Arbalist. Sven, 
you are the one who keeps going down, so I think you need to look a little more fabulous. I'm gonna poke my head on the second floor to update the bistro. One thing that you could do when you reach a new floor, since it will always reset your counter when you change, is you can just cautiously poke around near the entrance and get some of your map started. Don't go too far. You want to be able to hit those stairs before you enter danger. And so now we are going to want to reach the second floor quickly, so we are going to set up an automatic path. And automatic paths are smart enough to trigger uh, shortcuts if you've opened them. So don't be afraid to use those. I see you've successfully completed the Senatus's orders. I received their notification. You see, there is one item that may only be sold to explorers authorized by the Senatus. It's called an Ariadne Thread. When you're lost or wounded, use it to be teleported back to War Armor Road. You should always have one with you when in the labyrinth from this point on. Stare at all you want, though. I do not give them out for free. There's no percentage in that. Ah, it's you. What's the matter? What, you obtained a hammer in the forest to forge weapons? Well then, allow me to explain the process. You may use these hammers to temper weapons. Not for free, of course. Perish the thought. A nominal fee applies, which varies by weapon. Secondary materials will also be required. But if I've purchased them already, that will suffice. Let's table any questions for the moment and demonstrate. First off, you gotta remember, we are trying to keep things from frogs for the Bistro Lady. Be very careful when you go to Napier's and you've got a quest active. You don't want to accidentally sell what you need. And I think I only need two, but to be careful, but to be safe, I will keep them all. Oh, I should have enough. There's the slimy legs. Alternatively, you can drop by the bistro first and cash in any 
uh, quest you think you might have completed. Though keep in mind that if you're getting item rewards out of it, and you've got a full inventory, then you're going to have to throw something out and not be able to sell it. But the only thing we can upgrade is Saphira's weapon. It'll take a Mountain Claw and 55 N to do. Uh, but she will take from the inventory that you've already sold her, so it's not like we're holding on to that right now. So this chart will slowly get filled out as we progress. And as is usual with everything in this game, they don't explain things very clearly. So attack, I think, gives you a plus 3% to your strength-based damage, if you forge it onto that. Though it might be basic attacks only. Something to check up on. Uh, Vit, and anything else that's just a stat, will give you a straight plus 1 to that stat. Very handy early on, and some stats you'll want to increase over whatever you can get here. And this will add a small percentage chance that a normal attack with a weapon will inflict blind. I believe the first time you put a status onto a weapon, it will give 6%, and then any subsequent uh, forges will give 3%. I don't see why we shouldn't upgrade this, and I think Vit is probably our best option. Oh, and I should probably buy that very important thing. I want to do some swords. Hairband. Nah, not really. Well, the strap shoes. Yeah, I'm fine. buy accessories. It's nice having money. Next to your map, this is probably the single most vital piece of equipment in the game. Always have an Ariadne thread on you when you go into the labyrinth. You never know when you're going to fall into danger and you need to get out. Lickety split. There will come a time where you'll forget your Ariadne thread. You will not forget the walk home. your ingredients. I guess I'm basing some slimy legs then. Ah, accepting this quest, are you? It seems you're finally accustoming to the labyrinth. The visitors in the city have asked for a gigapede leg. Gigapede legs are used as fishing bait. Amaru does do a lot of fishing, you know. Of course, you must be fighting gigapedes to get to get gigapede legs. They only appear at night. The labyrinth becomes a very dangerous place at night. Keep your guardings high. I am counting on you once again, adventurers. Off you go to victory. Ah, uh, hello. Are you accepting this request? The girl at the shop made it. I am remembering that she said she wanted to speak about details in person. You go to Napier's firm and learn more about this request, yes? Yes! Off you go! Goodbye! Hmm, what do you want? 
Uh, curious about this one, are you? Maybe this one? Uh, I tell you what, I'm really thirsty. I could go for a nice drink about now. But water, you get nothing but his appreciation. You have to spend money for the tips. Ah! That hit the spot. This is called a red tail. It's a rarity that's highly sought after for its bright coloring. When you put the freeze on a claw shrimp, its tail turns all red. Don't tell anyone else about this, okay? It's our secret. Now that's the stuff! This thing here is a Gigapete's jaw. On the market, they call it a large jaw. I'm a knife man myself. When I'm looking for a weapon, I want one I can slash with. These are easy pickings for me. I just gotta cut down one of those Gigapedes at night, see? Don't tell anyone else about it, okay? It's our secret. So we got two tips on uh, item drops that require certain conditions to get. Get. So if we find shrimp, we should try to finish the moss by freezing them, and if we find gigapedes, we should try to cut them open as the coup de gras. Encountered any large bills yet? Those monstrous birds with the green bodies and huge beaks? They're so strong that you might have no idea how to take one. But here's the secret. They sleep at night. If you don't want to tangle with one, try doing your exploring at night. Though at night you gotta watch out for those nocturnal gigapedes. Nature's got you coming and going. Ugh, they're ruined! Hm? What, can't you tell? I'm trying to get the mud off of these things. I should never have watered into that muddy patch on B2F. I thought chased. I got chased all the way through it. That was terrible. You lose your balance in that mud, and you'll be some awful monster snack. Damn it! I paid a fortune for this anklet at Napier's. Now look at it! Don't push your luck in the forest. If a monster seems too strong for you, steer clear. Yes, it's gent Deadly Durian Sashimi. The Butterfly Bistro is famous for it. Deadly Durian is quite tasty, but you need to watch yourself if they appear along. Uh, if they appear alongside Titan Arums. Titan Arums may look like vibrant flowers, but every rose has its thorns. Plus a nasty smell. Between the two of them, the stench will be so terrible that you'll have a nasty time of it. Uh, excuse me, miss. Are my pickled Titan Arums ready yet? I think what I want to do is save first. And now we turn on our autopilot. This path is long enough that we're very likely to get into an encounter, but they're fairly weak at this point. With your first steps into a new floor, your spirits are high as you advance through the forest. However, a sudden, sharp voice calls to you from behind. Hold, explorers. There is much you should know to survive these depths. Heed my advice. You turn to find a young explorer before you. He is blonde and has a stern look that hints at greater maturity than his youth would suggest. 
Is this your first time on the second floor? He asks, as if gauging your mettle. Though he is alone, his presence is somewhat fearsome. You wonder how best to respond. We're quite experienced. You tell the man that you are experienced explorers, to which he gives a clearly mocking smile. Ah, pardon me. I'm here to give advice to newcomers. Advice which you, veterans, wouldn't need. The man, who is clad in a red outfit of foreign design, shifts his gaze to the forest ahead. Those who come here swaggering in triumph from the first floor usually die at that beast's hand. You follow the man's gaze to a powerful monster, the likes of which you've never seen. But who, save novices, would make such an error? Veterans like you should have no worries. The mocking smile does not leave the man's face as he disappears from view into the forest. I mean, he clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. Let's go pet the deer. Whoops. So these are probably the most potent innovation that the Etronasi series has. Those orange blobs are known as FOEs, which stands for Formido o Pugnatura Exequens. Which, I'm not sure if the grammar quite checks out, but roughly translates to The Pursuing Terror That Attacks You! If you were to be playing this in Japanese, you would have a much more intuitive, though far less romantic, name for them. The Field On Enemy! Because they're enemies that are on the field! But if you don't like that and you find the Latin a bit grating, you can always go with fun overpowered enemies. They introduce puzzling aspects to your explorations. And generally, when you encounter a new one, you do not want to be dealing with it. They are very powerful, on par with boss encounters, and usually too much for you to handle at first glance. Though they will be something you can overcome.
We're novice explorers. On hearing your honest answer that you are novice explorers, the man smiles and continues. Welcome, newcomer, to Armor Road. By now you must have been to the Senatus, no? The man who is, who is clad in a red outfit of foreign design speaks much more amicably than before. My orders from the Senatus are to give useful advice to novice explorers in this labyrinth. The man stops for a moment and shifts his gaze towards the dense thicket of trees further in. Those who come here swaggering in triumph from the first floor usually die by that beast's hand. You follow the man's gaze to a powerful monster the likes of which you've never seen. If everyone was smart enough to back away from fights they clearly can't win, there'd be no issue. But too many novice guilds perish from foolishly charging towards monsters beyond their abilities. I must caution you as well. Watch the enemy's movements before making your own. The man gives a faintly sardonic smile and bow before walking deeper into the forest. I look forward to meeting you again should our paths cross, he calls out as he walks away. Let's not pet the deer this time. You lure him out. And off he goes. I mean, really, you'd have to be some kind of idiot to walk straight into them. Like, who does that? You examine the vegetation-covered wall to find one section as hollow, with something shiny inside. You try peering inside, but it's too dark to make out whatever is glistening within. Probably wouldn't be hard to reach if you tried, but is that the best idea? What should we do? Uh, it hasn't always been wrong. Like the first one, you expected something bad to happen, and nothing bad happened. Though honestly, I'm looking less for advice and more for audience participation. If it's something bad, then I'll have to deal with it or reap the consequences. That's all. You're about to approach the hole when Sven suddenly stops you. You shift to Sven's vantage point and see that, in fact, a monster was hiding inside. What you saw before was the monster's hide, glistening with viscous fluids. The beast that had hoped to catch you unawares rushes out in a blur. Draw your weapons and fight! Oh dear. That looks like it'll be tough. Also looks like it might be poisonous. We've seen a lot of poisonous enemies, though.
Everything is fine. Carefully observing FOEs can get you good rewards. Ooh, very good rewards. So this is going to head into storage once we get back to the inn. What this is, is a severe discount on an item at Napier's firm. And it's a percentage discount, which means you save it for the end of the game, where the really expensive stuff comes out. If we can make it home. I warned about this. Big hit to a back row player. Bye bye, Venom Fly. Tough, but not something that can't be handled. Still, especially since we have a quest queued up for it, we're probably going to want to come back at night. Right, well, while we're in B1, let's check out that resting spot. So we have a quest for that. There's the frog parts. So since we got a level... Oh, we've been sitting on a skill point. I'm gonna grab one point in Dismiss Beast. What this does is it unsummons a beast, but you regain the TP that you spent to bring it out. You do lose the cost of Dismiss Beast. But you level it up and that cost goes down. Considering that these all cost a great amount of TP, this can be one way where we recoup some losses. is what we've been building up for. Fairly cheap. Deal strike and fire damage at random enemies two times. So about weakness and resistance in this game, they will calculate in favor of the player. So since this does strike and fire damage, if we come across something that resists fire, but it takes neutral damage from strikes, then it will take neutral damage from the entire attack. This makes it incredibly reliable. You are going to get Unbind. That gives us Resurrect. 
So now we can revive someone to 1 HP. Here you go, Fire Star. And now we want to start investing in Singularity, so we have to get Dark Star. Or Dark Ether. Well, this is a very interesting skill. If you cast it, you get to choose a row, and so long as those players have yet to act, any of their skills cost nothing. There are some ways to abuse this. And now we're going to switch off of Giant Kill to get some Bolt Mastery. I want to build towards a certain skill coming up. As you proceed through the forest, you find a dead end where the sun shines brightly. You suddenly recall the request you accepted about finding a place to sunbathe safely. Since you sense there are no monsters nearby, this would be a perfect place for sunbathing. You can return to the bar and report your findings whenever you feel like it. No rush. Take your time. Only when you're ready. Then it's time. That's 60 damage. That's pretty good, considering what everyone else is doing. The only thing that outpaces it is the poison. Well, that's not reliable yet. Definitely putting the coupon in the locker. Ah, you are returning to see me, yes? 
the frog dish that has been swimming in my mind can now become reality. I thank you. Perhaps you would be liking some? I am most sure it will be tasteful! Oh wait, yes. I am almost forgetting. You deserve reward for hard work. You will be getting more requests now, I am sure. Many thanks again! Ah, you are back! And alive, too! This is good! So you have found a safe place for Bill to sunbathe in? He will be happy to hear it. If he gets fired for napping when he is supposed to be working, it is not my concern. Well, regardless, here's the reward I look... Here's the reward. I look forward to further dealings with you. Alright, I want to stop by the Explorer's Guild. And we're going to take a look at our backup crew a little. Considering that the Venifly has not been doing much, I'm going to try putting air in the back so that when it comes out, it will be a front row fighter. And our party is now at level 5, which is a very important threshold. We take a look at rest. This is how you get all of your skill points back. There is a penalty, however. You will lose five levels. Now this is a lot better than it was in previous games, where you would lose a whopping ten levels if you were to rest one of your characters. So, comparatively, you get a lot of room to make mistakes and fix them. It's not something you want to do lightly, however. And, if you're finding that your party really isn't cutting it, don't rest them all at the same time. Rest a couple of them, and though some of them will be a little lackluster, and you'll also desync your levels, which I told you not to care about, uh, you will be able to still contend with reasonably powerful foes instead of essentially dropping all progress back a couple floors. All that said, if you rest before you reach level 5, it is free. So take stock of your team, see if anything's not working out, and if so, take advantage of this opportunity to correct course. Alright, so they want us to fish, they want us to get Gigapede stuff. 
And we need to get small flowers, which we're not going to be able to get today. book. It will be effectively the same, unless we're getting sewer to make physical attacks, which is generally not a good idea, but these low levels, we gotta conserve TP. You can forge it. Uh, we have Vit, Attack, and Blind. We're not going to be able to get blind up to a level that it's going to be reliable, and it also means that our mage is going to have to be physically attacking. Vit isn't a bad idea, though we don't know what material we need to forge it. Well, it is straight up an upgrade, and we've got some cash. Oh, frog cheeks, okay. Uh, it's gonna cost two, so we can only upgrade this once. Mm. I think fit. So the day and night mechanic is not something that crops up very often. There are a couple of skills that depend on it being different times of day. But things like monsters uh, showing up at different uh, times of day, not particularly common. This is an example floor that they don't really then go to capitalize on. There's the shrimp. So, uh, let's get rid of you. See, how are you hanging in there? Yeah, that yellow bag means we got the rare drop. The advice paid off. What's the map looking like? 
That looks like it's going to be a return shortcut, so I don't think I need to prioritize that as much. Platypus friend is back. They're tough. Oh, I guess they got unset since I changed my party. Um, for Doesn't look like we're gonna get a nearby shortcut soon. Uh, we're still in good condition. So we'll push the frontier. Hello! Set my limit skills. It's okay.
Now we got the tip that if we want the item, we're going to need to do slash damage to finish it off. Unfortunately, we only have one weapon that does slash damage, and that's on our healer. So, let's see if we can get it down to an appreciable level. Uh, it's really close. It's probably going to take two attacks. Maybe three. The GKP is a lot more manageable than the large bills. Or it is. I can keep counting. Not running out of numbers yet. There we go. Also worth pointing out at this point may have noticed if you're watching the map, or if you pieced it together, after seeing the FOE come from our left there, FOEs move during battles. Try not to be in their path when you're fighting. And if you are, get out of that path. Finish up the fight, run away if you have to, because if they step up, they will join the fight, and they don't care if you're already fighting other things. They will help out. Not you, them. What we did just pull, though, something I might actually throw on Era. If I could. But, okay, well, before I forget again, limit. Oh, that's why. So it's a sword that's usable by Princess Gladiator and Hoplites. These are fairly staple weapons for the series, where they come in with very weak attack, but a lot of buffs to a certain condition. So you throw this on someone that can use it, and their basic attack becomes nearly useless, but they have a decent chance of getting paral paralysis off. Uh, paralysis being that, like blind, you cannot dodge attacks, and you have a 50% chance of just straight up losing your action each turn. Jin having low HP. Giant kill is going to likely go off. Bye, Jin. Oh, you survived! Good work, team. We are out of healing. Seems like a great time to try out our Arya at an A thread. So 
We need legs. We got a jaw. That's okay. So the conditional drops tend to go for more than the normal ones. Need more gigapede legs if we want to get gloves. Leg guard. Yeah, we'll talk about that later another day. And buy one of these. That's probably a good investment. So monks have a skill form G. This gives you amazing buffs to all of your healing skills. Asterisk. This will increase the healing from healing, full heal, and line heal, and party heal. It won't do anything for refresh or unbind. And since resurrect uh, restores a static number of HP, it also will not be affected. Even so, even if we just stuck with healing level 2, pumping into that makes it more and more effective for a TP pittance.
Oh yeah, fairly straightforward. We're just gonna punch things harder and harder. This does bring the TP cost up, but we'll bring the damage up too. As you go forth, matching wits against dangerous monsters, you see a cloaked figure. Noticing you, the figure comes near. You can see it as female, and what's more, she is smiling. Hello! It is nice to meet you. You must be explorers from Armor Road. An incongruously cheerful voice comes from the girl, who, igno who ignores your bewilderment and continues. Also, that subtle pyrojack earmuffs. You needn't be frightened. My name is Olympia. I am active in helping explorers like you. The girl smiles again and hands you one of the backpacks she is holding. This is a camping tent. It is practically a necessity here. You may have it if you like. The girl called Olympia points to the right fork of the road ahead before continuing. That way lies a campground. It is a safe place to use your tent. Olympia looks again at the tent in your hands. Many explorers use tents to rest during their travels. You should make use of that spot as well. Though she has said little, the girl turns to leave as if there is no more for her to say. I will rest at the campground myself for a while. If you would like to talk more, come see me. The choice is yours. Investigate the campground Olympia spoke of, or continue on your way. She seems nice enough. You pass through a door to reach a small open space inside the forest. It is spacious enough to camp. You can see traces of countless others who have been here. Near the trees further in, you see a lone girl resting against one of the pines. You slowly approach the girl who leans nonchalantly against a tree. As she notices you, she smiles and addresses the guild. We meet again! How fare you in your travels? You try to remember if there's anything you wanted to ask the girl. Would anyone in the labyrinth really be so free with advice and expect nothing in compensation? You ask the girl called Olympia who she is and what reason she has to assist other explorers. Despite the suspicion evident in your voice, the girl is cheerful and upbeat as she answers. Don't worry about that. I have my own reasons. After some time, if you grow as strong as I think you will, I'll tell you what they are. Olympia then closes her eyes and shakes her head quietly. It seems futile to inquire any further. As the girl seems to be a veteran of the labyrinth, you ask her for suggestions on how to proceed. The girl looks up and thinks to herself before answering slowly. Hmm... Listen carefully. Some paths in the forest exist where you'd least expect them to. Even when you think you've come up against a wall or dead end, search carefully. If you find these hidden passages, traveling from town and back will be much easier. The girl looks at you and smiles once again. Looks as though she expects you to ask another question. You determine that you have nothing to ask her right now, and you tell her so. I see. I'll be here for a while longer, then. If you have any other questions, you can find me here. You say your farewells to Olympia, and resume your journey. This is a camp spot. If you have a tent, you can set up here. Unfortunately, Final Fantasy veterans, a tent is not a full heal. Is it going to tell us how much? Nope. And we're doing well enough that I don't want to break it out. It's there if we need it.
The door before you with a star-shaped insignia has no handle and does not budge when you push it. You seem to have no way to open this door at the moment. You leave it be for the moment to explore it elsewhere. Oh, it sounds familiar. teaching opportunity right there. These are mud tiles. And whenever we step in one, two turns will pass. As your boots stick slightly in some mud, you take a second look at the path you tread. On closer inspections, there are certain areas here that are like the marshy war- a marshy wetland. Doesn't seem too deep, but the mud does put a noticeable damper on your walking speed. You shudder to think how easily any monster chasing you through this muck would catch you. Make a note to be careful of the mud from this point on. Looks like I am not going down that path. just walk home and that will be it for the session. So as you can see, this is a nice, relaxing game where nothing bad ever happens. Something to just relax with after a long, stressful day. Should note that uh, your limit breaks are halved whenever you go to an inn, or rather your limit meter. Oh, so there's no sense on hanging on to it if you're planning on evacuating the dungeon. Use it smartly, of course, because you still have to leave the dungeon.
And we made it back home. I think we've made some pretty good progress. We just started out our adventures as a guild, and we're already one and a half floors down. Nothing can stop us now. And with that, we are going to wrap up. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. Hope you had a good time. And until next time, take care, everyone.